I'm sorry, but those stick figures cracked me up. I, uh, I haven't gotten used to those yet. Thanks a lot, Jameson, for that good work. I, I don't know what you're going to do to represent the story. Those are a lot of fun. So uh, last week, the last couple of days, we had this blood moon that kind of rolled through. And, and so my daughter and I went outside and watched it for about an hour or so. And uh, I got to tell you, there's nothing you could trade with me than that time with my daughter just talking and and looking up, and uh, as all that happened, it, it's, it's really cool because uh, we were down in Florida a couple of years ago, and we ended up going to one of the space centers in Florida, and so she got the bug, the space bug, like with me. And uh, I was a space shuttle guy, so that kind of dates me a bit, I guess, but uh, it was really exciting looking up and watching all this happen, this incredible, wonderful thing in this creation around us. And if you ask me, I think that's when God is doing His best work, when He's creating. And watching that uh, lunar eclipse come and go, it was just very impressive. And when we look at our story today, we see God creating it again. But He's creating a story for us and showing us this incredible world that we're in, but also a few lessons about our own humanity because we really can, um, well, uh, we have some frailties. And so we need a little help. And so in our story today, this parable of Jesus, uh, we're going to see this great creativity of Jesus coming out. And it starts off like this. Listen to another parable, Jesus says. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Now, I don't think many of us are vineyard owners here, though we may have visited or enjoyed the fruits of its labor, but a uh, vineyard was a common thing in this area. And Jesus is going to describe this basic process of putting together a vineyard and what that looked like, these basic steps. And also, on top of that, a vineyard for the hearers of their time would understand that as the people of Israel. He said that in multiple times in the Scriptures, that the vineyard is the people of God, His promised people. And so, here was the landowner, the actual Scripture says landlord, uh, for good reason, who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey, or another way of saying it, he went away to another country which was very common for owners back in the day. So Jesus Christ opens up with this incredible story by talking about this landowner, this landlord. And when we take a look at this, it's very important for us to piece this out. The landlord here handled all of the major expense and did all of the major labor. Think about it. You know, I, I come from poor dirt farmer guy. Uh, we still have farm on, on Jill's side and we cash rent the other side. Do you know how much it costs to get into the farming business today? You don't know because nobody does. Uh, you're talking about a couple million dollars worth of equipment on top of a couple million dollars in land, on top of a couple million dollars in startup operating costs, on top of a couple million dollars, and on and on and on. It's incredibly expensive. And then what we're seeing right here is someone who found the land, acquired the land, the great cost, and then he planted the vineyard. You know how long it takes to cultivate the land, to get things right, to have the knowledge to do this? He found the land, he planted the vineyard, he dug for the walls, he did the wine press, he built the watchtower, and then he went out of his way, which can be really troublesome this time of day sometimes, to find the rentors, right? And then he went out and found the right tenants for the land. So, with all of that, who is doing all the work here? Uh, I'm a little trifle deaf in this year. Who's doing all the work here? The landlord is, right? He's done all of this. And of course, Jesus is talking about our Lord who created this amazing space that I got to saw blood moon in. That was pretty cool. That's just him showing off sometimes. You get to see this amazing creation. He did all of this for us and set us here, right? He put his people here then to be fruitful and multiply. He, 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 he. And so right out of the gate, before we get into the story where he kind of leads us down this human frailty path, we need to see where Jesus is starting, because oftentimes we forget these pieces, and it leads to this terrible anxiety, it leads to stress, it leads to destruction, it leads to breakups, it just leads to all sorts in our life when we forget these first two incredible pieces of the story. We need to remember the Lordship of Christ 
the landlord, right? The lordship, Jesus is Lord of all. When we look at salvation, when we look at what's going on in the world, this is His creation, and on top of that, He breaks through into our world in order to give us something called peace in order to give us something called contentment, to give us something called life, not just now, but life that never ends with Him. And it all starts with lordship. Who is in charge of this ship anyway? Oh, man, when I look at our country, who's in charge of our country right now? Hmm, who's in charge of our world right now? And you're looking at human standards. I, I don't know. But God is making it very clear right out of the gate. He is Lord, and He's done all this for us. And that's really important with salvation because if He's the one who has the power to create it, hold it, and keep it, that gives me some hope that it's not my frailness that has to depend on all that, right? So He comes out in the story and shows this incredible landlord who's doing His work. Now, we don't use Lord a lot anymore, right? We don't have kings and lording over us, so every once in a while I go look up a word. This is back to confirmation days for some of you. What is a Lord? Well, a Lord has full authority and control over all things and people within a specific area. Uh, Full authority and control. So when we talk about Lordship, when you see it sung, when you see Lord in the Scriptures, when you see Lord in other material, that's acknowledging that Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, our Lord, is, has authority and control over all us and our life. And we want that as a Christian. We want Him to be um, guiding our life in a world where there are so many questions and difficulties in the months and, and years ahead in our life. We want that for us. So, He comes out, I didn't do this, He did this. Lordship. You have the land lord. And I know many landlords. They're not so bad. Um, it's a wonderful thing, this landlord. Want to know how clear He wants us to be? in his authority? (laughs) This is what it says through Paul as he writes about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. And if that wasn't enough, he rambles on. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together, and He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. Okay, one more time. So, you know, I'm, you know I'm, just, I'm not a fancy city preacher, so sometimes I have to kind of hear things again. Who is in charge? <laughs> the landlord? Jesus Christ. You're absolutely right. He is our Lord. Now, you'd think, John, this is so elementary. Why are you bothering? Jesus is bothering, not me. I'm just covering the story. And two, how soon we forget who's in charge. Oh, how soon we forget. And we slowly want to take over things ourselves, to bend it according to our will. Um, It's something else, isn't it? But it is by the lordship of Jesus, His supremacy, that we can have salvation at all, right? And so when the time came, the landlord sent for his fruit, correct? So if you have those, those tenants who've come in and worked the land, they're cash renting it out, whatever you want to think, that he's come, and so the harvest time has arrived, whose fruit, whose harvest does this belong to then? The Lord, right? And uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, of course, for me, being an executive, I uh, always ask, well, how much is that anyway? I mean, what are they taking? Is it all of it? Are they leaving anything to live? It was about 25%. They would usually make arrangement, but the landlord would take about 25% off the top. That's what the harvest. And when you look at that, you're like, meh, for the time period, that's not bad. I mean, you could do okay. Um, I pay more of that in tax right now. That's, that's not too bad. I'll take 25%. When the harvest time came or approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. Okay, let's look again here. Jesus is making a point. When the harvest time, when the harvest time, he sent his servants to the tents to collect his fruit. Who is taking credit for the fruit? Who who owns the fruit? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's his, and he sent his people to go get his cut his fruit, which is the next big point that Jesus is making. 
before he even brings us to that sort of that striking point where the story starts here and kind of goes, whoa. not only is he landlord, but God says on multiple occasions in Scripture that apart from him, we cannot produce fruit. You know what fruit is? You ever try and grow fruit trees in this town? I've tried. It's miserable. The squirrels want to eat it. The diseases get on it. It only lasts for so many years. It's a pain in the rear to make fruit in this town. And, and fruit, you know, that Georgia peach. I, I did a peach tree. But that Georgia peach where it's, you know, you, at the perfect time of year, you, you kind of bite into it and the juices seal in. And that, that beautiful, gorgeous, nourishing fruit. That's what God's talking about. He gives that to us in our world. He is the pedophilia. He is the one who built the genetics for that tree to even do that. He is the creator. He built the fruit. It's his. He produces this for us. And just as Jesus is Lord over all, he produces. And what's really cool about this is he produces salvation for us. Isn't that awesome? Jesus paid the price for us through his innocent crucifixion on the cross for the fruit of salvation. And that's wonderful, isn't it? Apart from Jesus, we would have nothing. But thanks be to God, we do, don't we? We do have things. We have access to salvation by faith. You know, Jesus said it himself. Let's just want to get technical about fruit. We'll talk about a vine and talk about a vineyard. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. <sighs> Okay. Now, on one side of me that says, yikes, you know, am I this incompetent uh, boobery of a, of a pastor and I can't do anything? But on the other side of that coin, it says, you know, Jesus has got my back and I will do the best I can. I will take the gifts he gives me and I will do what I can do. But in the end, the results are his. And there's a little bit of pressure that's lifted when you're not responsible for the results in that way, right? But that also means you can't take credit. <laughs> That's the drawback. And I got to tell you, we like to take credit for what we do. We love our egos. We love to take credit for the work we've gone through. But more of that later, right? It's all good right now. The story's going great. We have this great vineyard owner, and the tenants are working. They obviously produce fruit. The guy sent uh, the, 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 the folk in to get through. Everything's going great, right? Things are going great. Thanks be to Jesus. All these things are happening, and yet... We hear from Jesus as he paints an entirely different human reality here. So when those servants arrived, the tenant seized his servant. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Ouch. Now, if you are a biblical scholar, not a simple pastor like me, you, you could probably look right back to those examples and in, in, in the Scriptures where this is what happened when he sent prophets in to help them, right? But in this case, we're just talking about those picking up the fruit. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent another group. Now, some landlords would call this man foolish. Why would you even go a second time? Deal with them now. But forgiving, loving, sends the, the next group. Then he sent another group of servants, right, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Just look at the numbers. How awful. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. So, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Well, that story took a downturn. What is going on here? Why would God lift up at the beginning? Remember who's in charge. Remember the Lordship. Remember who's responsible for the results, for creation itself, for just the basic pattern of the way the, the world works. Who is in charge of all this? Who set this up? Why would Jesus talk about those two? It's because we forget. We might not like it the way the Lord likes it, so we're going to bend it to our will. I want to get credit. You know how hard it is to go all year long producing and working in the field and then giving it to somebody else? That belongs to me. I don't care who owns it. You know how hard it is to work year after year, decade after decade, to do something or produce something, and then at the end someone else takes credit for it? 
Do you not feel something when that happens? Do you not get angry when someone takes credit for something you've done? What is that in us? There's a peace in us as human frailty. We want to be God. We want to be Lord. We want credit. We want that fame. And nowadays, you know, some of the uh, uh, digital community sort of touts that to try and get you famous, right? To try and get you out there, to do these pieces. There's something in us where we want I this and I that. We want to bend it to our own will. And I have to really check myself there too, let's be honest. You know, today I zipped over to East Campus in between preaching at the first one to talk about the building expansion and, and all the different pieces we're doing here and opening up different campuses and all that fun stuff. Um, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of working with people. And I, more than anyone, have to keep that in check, right? I'm the executive pastor. This is how it's going to go. Well, I, I'm no interior decorator, but I know what I hate, and I hate that. Um, instead of checking things, following God's Word. It's interesting. When we start to kind of ram through things and we start to do things the way we want sometimes apart from God, we stop reading His Word. We stop praying. We stop thinking about what He has to say. and It's going to be our way. This is who He's speaking to then. The religious leaders had all but abandoned God and slowly over time did their own thing. And it's amazing when we do this, when we kind of jettison the teachings of God and we just kind of go our own way because we just don't want to do it, how far we get. And when we look back, we see where have we come? Is this not the most idiotic thing? Do you see how far these tenants have gone in that time and space? Does that work nowadays? So let's say I'm, I'm in a house and I kill the landlord's son. Does that mean I get the house now? Does that make any sense to you? It didn't make sense then. It doesn't make sense now. Do you see how corrupt the minds had gotten of the farmers, of the tenants? They had so twisted their way away from reality, from truth, from God's teaching that they were out of control. This is idiocy. This is absolutely absurd. And Jesus knows it. Jesus is definitely addressing those who fancy themselves as rulers over the church and is certainly reminding us and them that they are simply custodians of what God has given. It's interesting. They're usurpers. That's a good word. So is hubris. Why don't you go look up this word hubris? That's a good sin. That's a juicy sin there, hubris. Hubris is about pride. It's about our ego. And when that's hurt, we can do some awful things. But you know what? When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, oh, they knew. <laughs> they knew over the years that they had abandoned the Word of God. They had abandoned the teachings of their forefathers and mothers, and they had walked this incredibly selfish path. And it didn't lead to life, right? It didn't lead to life. And when they knew they were talking about Him, well, they were a little bit upset. You could just see Him in the back, you know. This is in the back row. But there are a lot of people there. We'll do it later. But we got you. Hey, we got you. You just see them stewing in the back because there's that. What's worse about getting your own way is when people call you out on it. <laughs> That's really bad. And it seems to happen so slowly. But you know what? When we lose sight, of the true capstone, when we lose sight of the markers of our forefathers and mothers, when we lose sight of the truth, this is what happens. Jesus says that He is the stone the builders have rejected, but it has become the capstone, the most important stone. The Lord has done this. <laughs> so who's doing the work again? I, 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 I get confused. Uh, it seems like, yeah, the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes, right? But we are always soon reminded who is truly in control. Throughout time when the church, and uh, we struggle with this, the church needs to be checked. And when we start to wander on our own, a reformation happens or a revival happens, and, and we are checked. And what's certainly interesting is it's nothing new. It's we're checked back to the standard. We're checked back to where God began, where He started us. It's never a new thing. It's just a check back to the source, back to truth, you know? When someone says they have a new thing, <laughs> I have a hard time telling the difference between the new thing and schizophrenia. I really do. But Jesus is letting us know this stuff, right? There are some things we need to hold to. 
And he warns them, he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. He who falls will be crushed by it, right? I mean, this is what's happening. So, we have the lordship of Christ, we have him producing the fruits, and then we have this thing about human frailty where we just, it's hard for us not to want to be gods, not to want to be in control, and not to do it our way. Have it your way. That's a clever phrase. I think someone should take that and patent it and use it. If you have it our way. But in the end, who is in control of all of this? This is how Jesus ends. He has lordship, he has the power to give it. Second, he produces the fruit, this incredible salvation, and he's reminding us he controls it. And Jesus is free to do as he wills. He is Lord. He can do what he wills with it. Jesus Christ is Lord and has full authority and control over all things, and Jesus is about to explode all over the church. He is, just to explode all over the thing. There was no evangelical wing of the Hebrew church. There wasn't. There was no welcome center. There were no snacks when you came in. None of that. You were born into the promised people. It was a tight, closed group. And if you entered into that faith, you had to prove yourself through tests and time and connection. Jesus is starting the process. They didn't understand yet of saying, I'm going to blow this thing up and we're going to do something else because he controls it. He can do that. He's going to open up the gates of salvation to all people, and that's big for you and me, right? That's huge. So, he's telling the story, and he asked them, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now, I'm reading the story. I'm getting mad. You know, I hate that when you watch TV shows, and they get you all worked up under a certain opinion, so you're so angry about a certain person, then they unveil later that that wasn't it. Um, but you get so mad when you're like, of course you would just deal with these tenants. I would bring down everything. Get out of here. And they said it. Now, this isn't Jesus' response. This was the people listening to the story. They were mad too. Who are these awful people? <laughs> That's us, by the way. But who are these awful people? He will, bring those, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants. Very responsible. Who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And then Jesus drops the huge bomb, and he would do this, but the people didn't understand it. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He's about to expand it from a closed community to everyone. They just didn't get it yet. He was still walking around, right? Just didn't get it yet. But Jesus is teaching about this new reality to come, which is why you're sitting in this pseudo-worship gym center, right? It's why you're standing here today. It's because of what he did here. Paul reminds us, you are all sons of God and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you all are Adam's seed and heirs according to the promise. Before this time, you had no God, you had no future, you had no life, you had no community. But now that Jesus has come, the Lamb Lord, to call upon his people, he died for us so that he can open this up for all of us. Open it up, yes? So now all of you have a place to belong. You have identity. You have belonging. You have a purpose because Jesus is working in our world and in our midst. How cool is that? So, I've been watching all these stupid commercials that have all these acronyms, you know, like BMX YOLO. You've seen that one, right? So, I look at all that and go, why can't I create an acronym? I'll create my own. Here it is. Do you guys remember what it is? I took the cheat out. Two weeks ago, I preached here. And I, I put the… Uh, do you guys remember what it is? Um, what do you want from me now? Yeah, I, I would add a few more letters, but it doesn't fit right on the screen. But, yeah, I'll get to So, what in the world? So, all of this, so what do you want from me now? This is key for us, so to, to, to walk away, to take away, we need to hold God's name holy, okay? We need to remember who God is. We oftentimes do this in prayer where we just acknowledge who He is. We remember His Lordship. 
And we want that because He is the Creator, and He delivers these amazing goods, and He produces this fruit. So we need to remember the order of things. Because oftentimes humanity, like God's here, we're here, we like to creep up. <laughs> we have an uh, insatiable uh, desire to bind God and free ourselves. <laughs> it's just the opposite, isn't it? So we need to remember who He is. You know, He's in charge. We need to remember that, that order in our life. Second, and then we'll be done. We'll be out of here. We need to listen to and follow God's Word. You know, I, uh, I, I, I teach sort of the first step classes here, those new members who would like to join and kind of get active. And I, I ask a question that matters to me. I used to ask, like, what, what was the first car you owned? And people ramble on, and it takes too long. So I finally learned to ask the questions that matter to me. How, how did you get here, and why are you staying? Like, well, why are you here? Is my question. And I've been doing this now for almost 15 years. And do you know what the number one answer is? And it blows my mind. Why people are here? Because we use Scripture. That's it. Well, fellowship and you guys are okay and you're fun to be around, whatever. But they say Scripture. You guys actually use the Word of God. You use it when you preach. That's why we're here. What else would you do as a church? But I guess, you know, I don't visit a lot of churches. I'm here, you know, I have a job to do. But isn't that interesting? We need to make sure we stay connected to the power source, hmm? to listen and to follow God's Word. It's very important for us. Anyways, so Christ Jesus is our Lord. He is the way. He is the truth and the life. Jesus is in control and has opened the kingdom of God for all who believe. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Thank you for that. We just need to remember who God is and honor His Lordship as we listen to and follow His Jesus' his teachings throughout our life. So, and we all need to have that. And for all that, we thank Him. Amen.